Oh, dudes and dudettes, welcome back to the channel, man. Until you appreciate you being here with me all today. So glad you decided to join me. We're doing a documentary of the 20th Maori Battalion. So let's jump right into it. This is the story of the Maori Battalion, told through the experiences of five of our comrades. It cannot hope to be a complete record, but at least it tries to demonstrate the price which these young men were prepared to pay for the privileges of citizenship. It is a story about young people who, along with the other units of the New Zealand Division, contributed to the Division's fame. We hope that the young people of today can identify with some of the things which motivated the Ropu Atu Matawenga, the 28th Maori Battalion. I think it's sad that this is a way to get citizenship to a country is to go and eradicate other human beings from their country. I feel like there's something just innately wrong with that. I understand defending. I do not understand attacking. I mean, I do. I can I can see how it fits into the grand scheme. These people over here need something. These people over here have it. You got to go get that thing in order to survive. I get it. But at the same time, there's enough for everybody. You don't have to have that person's thing. And it's just it's, that's just some of the random thoughts that I have, man. I mean, hey. Kawakato <laughs> The Duke of Gloucester made an inspection of this later bunch of nails in a dictator's coffin. Among the troops inspected on this occasion were many Maoris, men whose destiny is linked with that of the whole British Commonwealth of Nations and who mean to keep it so. The march passed. It's hard to say which of the Empire's troops from overseas look best, but they're all good enough to prove better than any the enemy can produce. The Maori Battalion was a World War II infantry unit. It was made up entirely of volunteers as a result of efforts made by Maori parliamentarians and tribes. As part of the New Zealand Division, it saw action in Greece, Crete, North Africa, and Italy. Wow. One of its most resolute but respected enemy leaders was Erwin Rommel. The Desert Fox considered New Zealanders to be the finest troops on the Allied side. That fierceness, bruh. Over three and a half thousand Maori soldiers fought for God, king, and country. Two-thirds of them were wounded 
or killed. Wow. Contributing to the most grim and final legacy of war. So sad, man. They volunteered their lives. War was a frequent element in the lives of the many societies of ancient Polynesia. Competition and revenge for insults or grievances were the main causes of conflict. Competition and revenge for insults or grievances were the main causes of conflict. Because somebody said something. That's what he just said. That the reason that there's been so much going on down there is because somebody who said something insulting to somebody else is it really that simple is it really that simple i don't want to believe that it just came down to somebody talking crap and somebody not being able to handle it and going to slap somebody because because of it that's so wild to think that by his definition ego is the most is the most is the thing that's that's the problem ego not being able to let something ride off your shoulder i'm sure it's more complicated than that but from what he just said it's sad in new zealand the Maori refined their warlike heritage to take into account the climate and terrain of their new home. Hmm. The people lived intimately with their environment. This way of life ensured that war was fought in harmony with the seasons. A time to draw sustenance from the land and a time to fight for it. From birth to old age, men were trained in the skills of warfare. Mm. There are no medals to record their deeds. Valor is commemorated in art. Valor is commemorated in art. That's hard. British and colonial troops found in the Maori a staunch adversary. Their physique, I bet. fitness, endurance, and speed could not be bettered. Second to none. How you gonna come in on my land and expect me not to know everything about my land and how to do away with you on my own land? I got home field advantage, bruh, bruh. <laughs> Military tactics so impressed the British that they recorded them and utilized them in wars from the Crimea to the Somme. The Maori was such a formidable opponent that Britain took lessons and notes on how to fight from the Maori. Oh, oh. These traditions of combat were passed down from generation to generation and were suddenly rekindled by a spark which ignited worldwide conflict. The Maori people were determined to play their part in their own way and began recruitment of a fighting unit ready to take up arms beside the Pākehā, their European counterparts. It was amazing the number of people who came along to volunteer their services. It was uh, some sort of a look forward to excitement, going abroad and this sort of thing. So they came in their hundreds in uh, the particular places we went to on their horses, tied their horses outside and 
one of my jobs was to drill them, give them sort of elementary training and sort of standing at ease up to a tension slope arm with a broomstick and this sort of thing. And that, that, that um, made them very, very happy. And of course they were faking their ages and how old are you? Oh, 21. Some of them were 50. Uh, are you married? No. And they had about three or four children. You know, it, it, it was really amazing. <clears throat> People ready to put their life on the line to protect their homeland. To, to... Bro, in some ways, I overstand, and in some ways, I just don't get how that became normal. I just... I get it and I don't get it at the same time. There's six brothers in, in uh, my family, but it wasn't an isolated case. And there were many cases of Maori families who had uh, six and seven sons uh, that uh, went to the war. There were the uh, one son. Your entire family goes to war? Ah! And families, and uh, that was really difficult. I was one of them. and. Uh, I had only, there were only two of us in the family, a sister, and uh, the first thing my dad said when we were having tea, when New Zealand declared war against the Germans, he said, there's plenty of time. That's all he said, plenty of time. And I thought to myself, well, it's going to be hard, all right? And uh, I felt sorry for my mother. If I was to join, there'll be only two people left at home. However, when my friends started going to for medical and so on, I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to be left behind. And it was a hard decision to make to go to the to war. I bet. I bet it was hard to make the decision between going and fighting alongside your brothers and your friends versus staying at home with your family, but knowing that you could aid in the protection of your family, but the, the not being there with the family in the first place and the worry and the stress of not coming back, but knowing that you're doing something ultimately for the greater good. And if it's not the greater good, at the very least, the thought process is defend my brothers, defend my homeland, defend my family. That's crazy. And what's interesting is the Pakiha of, of New Zealand went and waged war and and the Maori of New Zealand participated in it. But it seems like the Pakeha of New Zealand is what joined in with the rest of Britain. I may have this wrong because I'm, I'm just thinking out loud, but it's just interesting to me. Strict training under superb Pakeha leaders commenced. An initial problem was with the World War I uniforms issued. Oh no, Freddie Jones had to laugh. Yeah. And he said, oh, well, <clears throat> of course, he said, um, those uh, uniforms are made under English uh, specifications, you see. <laughs> they were built for Englishmen, not for for New Mar Zealanders. Marys. Or Maoris in particular. <laughs> and you see these tight pants. These Maoris built different, brother. <laughs> they got legs like tree trunks and arms like legs. <laughs> they, well, they couldn't hardly get their legs through them. <laughs> Here, and the coach right down to the knees bruh how menacing would somebody look like they, they, they would look i just got a mental image they would look like hulks like a, just an army of hulks that had outgrown their their attire oh that would have looked so hard oh my goodness i'd have been so scared and they, Dad's army. And they issued them with berries <laughs> to match Oh, yeah, yeah. This guy's life is killing me. <laughs> now, those boys had to turn around and um, uh, spend uh, what little money they had to take them to some tailor and get them altered. And within a week or so, uh, they were looking quite smart again. 
you want me to come fight for you and you're not even going to give me. You're going to make me go and tailor the clothes that you gave me to help you fight your battle. In a deliberate move to ensure that the battalion be Maori in identity as well as name, it was divided into tribal companies. A company was made up of North Auckland tribes. B Company from Rotorua, Bay of Plenty, Taupo, and the Coromandel. C Company comprised East Coast tribes, notably the Ngati Poro and Rungo Fakata. D Company covered a wider area where there were fewer Maori. Waikato, Hooks Bay, Taranaki, Wellington, the South Island, Chathams, and Stewart Island. That's a big chunk. They parade again, 2,000 members of the 2nd New Zealand Expeditionary Force in Wellington before leaving for service overseas. For the second time in a quarter of a century, the manhood of the Dominion has heard and answered the call to imperial duty. So this is goodbye, good luck, and a safe return. It's insane to, like, take a step back and break it down and understand that each of these men ultimately and again I get the premise but just listen to what I'm saying that these men have signed up to now I hey look I get it the whole defense and having to protect and doing what you got to do but still still there is an acknowledgement of duty and that your duty is to destroy your enemy. It just seems. I don't even know what it seems like. It's, it's, it is what it is. Ship, I suppose it was supposed to carry uh, about 2,000 people. And uh, when we left New Zealand, we had 4,000 troops. Wow. And wow. It was hard on the men. As far as the officers were concerned, of course, we had the. Uh, a deluxe uh, accommodation and dining room and cocktail rooms and so on. It hadn't been uh, changed in any way whatsoever. And it was a beautiful ship on top where the lounges were, but not down below. It was too cramped. And uh, some of the men, of course, were below two decks, I think, below water level. And... Uh, mm -mm. I, whenever I was on duty, I didn't feel like going down to the bottom decks. You had to go down and see your men and uh, the conditions weren't too good. The original destination of the troop ship Aquitania was Egypt, where training would commence with New Zealand soldiers of the first echelon already there. The racist policies of South Africa meant that, for the Maori, leave in Cape Town was limited. During their period in South Africa, the evacuation at Dunkirk took place. An invasion of England appeared imminent, and the convoy changed course from Egypt to Britain. Well, I mean. What an incredible distance to travel to go and murk somebody. Good grief. The damn voyage alone took probably yeah, months I suppose the route parts we had every day we just about walked to england every day we went round and round the ship and the, it was a big ship and going round it oh boy it's mighty long we felt as if we walked to england the relationship uh, between the parkers and, and maoris was terrific um, they got along very, very well together, no respect. In fact, um, Parkers, I think, were nearly as bad, if not worse, and, and then the Maoris were getting into mischief. Uh, I think it was a normal relationship at home, you know? Yeah. Between the Parkers, there was no difference. As a matter of fact, uh, it was great. No difference whatsoever. Yeah. It's just, it's interesting to see how tragedy war hardship brings people together it's very interesting that's beautiful we had i think how come we can be copacetic in war but when in times of peace since we don't have anything to hate together on the same side now we turn that 
inwards and that we hate each other instead of having a common enemy. If we don't have a common enemy, each other becomes our enemy. That's what it that's what it seems like to me. Matt, five, People need something to battle. People need something to fight. And a lot of times they take it out on other people. But it's mostly about that internal battle is what I'm coming to find out through my learning and my healing is that if things were right in here, you wouldn't have to do what you're doing out there to people in order for you to feel something in here. You know what I mean? It's just something that I'm picking up. Indian nurses were the only women on board. And uh, as time went on, you know, we were in the water six or eight weeks altogether, these nurses looked pretty and pretty as the journey, the journey <laughs> continued. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, these... <laughs> What's an ANZAC? 16th June 1940, Gurok, Scotland. The Mari Battalion arrive in the United Kingdom keen to protect its shores from the Nazi threat. Another step on the great adventure that has caused many of them to leave their tribal homes 17,000 miles away. They bring with them their language, songs and cultural expressions of war. An easy marriage with the British traditions of army discipline. For the duration of the war, Reinforcements from New Zealand will keep the battalion's ranks filled with an average of 800 men, mostly young. We should do the same things as the other battalions. We didn't want to be mollycoddled or anything. Whatever they did, we had to do it too. And, uh, well, at the same time, I think we were feeling that we'll be better than them. There was, there was no I love that. He was there during the war. I don't think so. Uh, there was rivalry, yeah. friendly rivalry, but there wasn't jealousy yeah. Yeah. No. or antagonism. No. You know why? I bet I'm assuming that they didn't have time. Because if they spent time quarreling with each other, the enemy would take them over. So they had to work together. But then when that was gone, they turned on each other again, forgetting that they, that the Maori actually helped them in the victory. It's like you use me and then you brush me aside and, and treat me like I didn't just do what I did for you. That's disgustingly wrong, man. Ugh. Even competition among platoons, weren't there? Oh, yes. Amongst companies. I know mine, mine was the smartest in the A company. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> spent too much time. Look at that handsome young man. Shoes and so on. He was always pick and spare. <laughs> I can remember Rangi Logan in charge of headquarters, training uh, headquarters uh, to, to beat the rest of the companies. And he was very, very disappointed the way they were uh, drilling. And, and Rangi Logan said, if you had skirts, you'll be cheap mutton. <laughs> <laughs> I like the delivery, but I didn't hear it. If you had skirts, you'll be cheap mutton. <laughs> you'll be cheap mutton? <laughs> I love his laugh. Marching Such a youthful a laugh. Parade, you see, the A Company will be, of course, first on the mark and then B Company uh, uh, would march on again because uh, when it, the orders to halt uh, were given, the, everybody was uh, uh, trying to put on a good show and you hear A Company says, uh, <clears throat> under their breath, the penny divers. <laughs> <laughs> so then C Company would march on and you'd hear the uh, Rotary boys say, the cowboys. <laughs> halt! They go to halt! Ah, the cowboys. Oh. And of course, so long along the line. <laughs> Fears of an invasion of England diminished. In April of 41, the Maori were rushed from training in Egypt to assist in the defense of Greece. It was a catastrophe. 
The German forces and Luftwaffe overwhelmed them. Hopelessly outnumbered, they were forced to retreat from their first taste of combat. Mm. Attention immediately shifted south to the island of Crete. The battalion followed. The increased use of fighter planes and bombers in World War II meant that those who controlled Crete and her airports would have control too over much of the Mediterranean Sea. The gentle existence of the Cretan people would soon be ruptured by every violation that war could offer. The magnitude of that statement just now. Oh my goodness. Noch einmal ist England im Besitz von Kreta. On the morning of the 20th of uh, May 1941. Petrifying. Petrifying. Seeing a whole bunch of stuff parachute down from the sky. Absolutely. No, thank you. We were sitting having breakfast under some wild trees just below this mound when we heard a continuous buzz from the sea. And we looked over and the sky was black on the horizon. It was the beginning of the invasion. It was a beautiful sight. And uh, because uh, it, it was something new, something unique to any warfare, we were dumbfounded and I bet. we looked at the planes in amazement more than anything else. I bet. When we got into our positions up here, the planes were flying almost level with the positions we had and so on. And we could see the doors open with the first parachutists ready to jump and so on. But they flew straight past us and we couldn't do anything about it, although they were close for any person to shoot at. But above us were fighter planes crisscrossing all the time, only 10 feet above us, so we couldn't do a thing. Soldier and historian Dan Devon. My goodness, the overwhelm. Oh my goodness, the overwhelm. Wow. Later wrote, the sight was inexpressibly sinister, for each man dangling carried a death, his own, if not another's. What I say? What I say? And this is signing up knowing that this is the end goal. To take as many lives as possible and for yours not to be taken. And that if yours is taken, take as many as you can before you go and, and give yourself up. Come on, man. That's it's just something innately wrong with that. Again, I get defending. I get volunteering to defend. But just the whole going to attack somebody kind of thing. It's just, I've never been that kind of person. I always, always try to, I've never been an attacker. I'll defend with everything I got, but I've never been an attacker. I'll finish an attacker, but I've never attacked somebody. What is that? That, what is that? Why do people do that? That's somebody that doesn't think of repercussions or if it was done to me, how would I feel about it? There's no kind of thought like that. And now just these people need those people. Those certain people need to be dealt with, with violence, with, with violent violence so that they realize what they're doing to others. Crap. Colonel George Dittmer was given instructions to counterattack. The battalion left their Platanias positions for the German-held areas to the west. As in Greece, confusion. Deadlines to begin the advance came and went. When the advance finally began, there was heavy opposition. They were very, very late. There were no tanks or air force support. Surrounded on land, strafed and bombed from the air, they carried on. So did the Germans. In kurzer Zeit is der Flugplatz Malemes in deutscher Hand. 
The Maleme aerodrome was one of the key areas to the control of Crete. It was an open door for the German occupying army. This hill overlooking the Maleme tarmac was the Mari objective. If captured, no enemy plane would have been able to land. The door would be locked. Under heavy fire, they battle their way through dense vegetation, guided by a system of irrigation canals. Wow. The morning of the 22nd of May, we arrived above the aerodrome at Malimi and uh, had a good look at the aerodrome, and uh, we spotted a few of the Germans walking around. So I turned around and borrowed the uh, brain gun off my, one of my boys. And I got down and prepared to fire. And as soon as I squeezed the trigger, something happened. A bullet, uh, a stray bullet or a bullet from a sharpshooter penetrated the barrel of my gun and split it open. So my word. Not, let's not mention how close that is to his hand, to his arm, to his shoulder, to his chest, to his head. That, imagine it, you pointing to fire. Look at the distance here. Th Bruh, my brain would have broken in that moment. And then be like, that, that barrel could have been my skull, bruh. Woo! Bruh, that's hey, I, I guess, man... I don't know what I do. I guess I turn back to my friend and grab another one. Give me the other. <laughs> Bruh, it's insane to think about what some people have been through and what they did during that time. And it's mind boggling to think of experiences that people have had. Oh, I gotta go pee so bad. I don't know if I'm gonna make it. Made it. Bowled me over, and there I was. And uh, the over, penetrated the barrel of my gun and split it open. So I bowled me over, and there I was. And uh, the first thing I thought about was my mother at home. And then I saw stars, and I saw everything, and I thought, oh, this is beautiful. This is a lovely way of dying. Wow. And, uh, however, I waited and waited. And then I recovered, I suppose. And I got stood up. And I looked around the boy who was firing beside me. He was firing with, with his rifle. And I thought he had struck me with the barrel of his rifle. However, he, he was still firing. And then I asked him, what happened? Did you hit me? And he looked up and he said, oh, he said, you're shot. Mind you, he didn't say it that way. He said a few words besides that. <clears throat> and then I fell down again and the blood started to pour. Prior to that, there was no, not a drop of blood. What did I say? I just said that. What I would have automatically started thinking. And to find out he actually was hit. And then some of my boys rushed over and uh, bandaged my face and so on and uh, led me away to the uh, RAP. Wow. The attack failed. Orders came to withdraw. To prevent the exhausted soldiers being cut off by the enemy, the battalion were redeployed east of Hanya, away from the action, they thought. Then this is the direction of the uh, counterattack. Yes, we're right on it, I think. And uh, prior to this, I had just returned to the uh, battalion, but uh, a cousin came over to meet me, and we hid among some rushes because he had a can of fruit, preserved fruit. <laughs> Didn't want any of the other company boys to see us. And lo and behold, we didn't know that the Germans were quite close to where we were until we had the burst of machine gun fire and uh, there it was. What was the reaction of the Germans when the uh, banner charge began? Well, 
The only thing they could do was to get as much shelter from the machine gun fire and so on. Mm. And they all got in behind these uh, olive trees, as you see. Because of the clear path in between the trees, they had to use one tree for 20 men or something yeah. in a scrummage formation. And after the, the attack was over, we had yeah. a look, oh boy. It's hard to imagine people still standing on their feet in a scrummage formation. Mm. They were so thick that they were held up by the density of their bodies. You know. German casualties were, were pretty heavy, so uh, our, our blokes must have got right into them. Well, I, I've seen one of my boys uh, charged with the bayonet, and the tip of the bayonet went right through. One of his friends was so close, he just touched the tip of the bayonet, touched his friend. Well, as you said, Don, uh, there'll be convulsions and I, I don't know what else. And uh, there's a heck of a lot of shock as far as the recipient <coughs> would be concerned. Yes. And, and, uh, Many times mm. also, the, uh, um, when the bayonet went in, they have to uh, fire a around ah, yes. from the rifle to yeah. create the looseness to, mm. so they can get it out. Oh, in most cases, they just put their foot on the body of the, of the opponent oh. and uh, jerk their rifle out. It's not so simple to pull it out because the muscles start to contract, to contract over it. Yeah, yeah. bruh. I, honestly, I've seen so many movies that this stuff, it's like I already know it. But a part of you knows that what you're seeing on screen is not real. It's a depiction of real things sometimes, but it's not real. And there's a part of you that knows that no matter how good the graphics are, no matter how good the actors are, but to understand that actual human beings went through that actual experience not knowing anything about anything other than the fact that go here, Merc, go there, Merc, try not to die. It's like, oh, oh my goodness, how wild. The 42nd Street bayonet charge drove the Germans back nearly a mile, killing over 80 of them. Among the victims were Cretans who had befriended the Maori and who had been used by the Germans as human shields. Uh, that's disgusting. The battle for Crete was lost. The New Zealand and Australian men wearily trudged the mountainous route to Svaikia, where the Navy would evacuate them. The Germans were too late to prevent the escape, but found nearly 6,000 men left behind. There had not been enough room on board for everyone. What? The final ignominy of failure. Oh, no, no, brought them there with no way to get back, fudge. It was terrible as far as we were concerned. Prior to deciding who we were going to say and so on, people were saying, well, you're married, you go and so on. But the officers had the last word. We felt sad for them, and they felt sad for us because they thought, well, we might get bombed anyway. But when we got on the ship, across, uh, we, we were so pleased to get away from Crete, we forgot the others until we got back to Alexandria. The Sinsphora of the German in the Mach of Crete it was a very big deal. The only thing that can be said is that so many thousands of miles away from the country that was brought here to fight with us, it was impossible to write it. It is incredible. And even if the people of this area in this area can say that it was completely unprecedented for all the Germans who were here. Because their own people couldn't see it. Many airplanes were brought here. Wow. 
και όπλα εμεί δεν είχαμε μόνο από τι άκτε, μακριά από τα αεροδρόμια. Όλοι οι Γερμανοί που σκοτωθήκαν γύρω στην περιοχή οφείλεται ει του Νεοζηλανδού που υποστηρίζανε το αεροδρόμιο και το ύψαμα τούτο. Incredible. Incredible. It's so multifaceted. War is everything is multifaceted in a way. It's incredible that even though there's so much bad, that there is some good that comes out of it, like defending Crete. And having them not be just another German thing or another you know what I'm saying? Another another outpost, right? Ah, I'm so stuck at the middle. I'm pr I'm pr I'm happy and proud that Maori and the New Zealanders could do that and help Crete from the Germans. But also, wouldn't we have liked it where that wasn't the case and they didn't have to go and volunteer themselves for sacrifice through this war and and. It, Ο πόλεμος γενικά είναι μια καταστροφή, ένα κακό πράγμα βέβαια. Αυτό οφείλεται στη μεγαλομανία και στα συμφέροντα... The waste of lives is the fault of those in power. Absolutely. Again, I said at the beginning, ego, man. It's their ego. Sheesh. And, it, and they don't even have... The ones pulling the war strings aren't even the ones fighting. They're enlisting your family, your children, your relatives, your friends. They're... The people that are sending your family to war don't go to war themselves. Why is that okay? In Troy, where Heath Ledger was the was the lead actor, those men on the opposite side were old men and they were still fighting. I don't have respect for people that send people to do what they don't do themselves or what they would not do themselves. If you too old for war, don't call for war and send people that are not also you. I feel like a lot of war would stop that way. Me personally. Τον μεγάλο, τον τρελόν, αποκλειστικός. Που σκοτώνται άνθρωποι που δεν ξέρουν καλά καλά για ποιο σκοπό σκοτώνται. Και εμείς είδαμε σε αυτό το πόλεμο πάρα πολλά κακά γιατί και ολοκαυτώσεις και καταστροφές και μεγάλα πράγματα γίνηκαν. The soldiers, pre the New Zealand soldiers' presence was invaluable. They are our brothers, says this Cretan. No, ew, no. Crete. Cretan, Crete, Crete person. Person from Crete. Man from Crete. Would they be called Cretans? No disrespect, just curious. <laughs> και εμείς τους θεωρούμε σαν αδέρφια μας. Εδώ αυτό της μάρτυρας ο αείμνηστος ο Πατεράκης ο Μανώλης ήρθε εδώ να ζητήξει βοήθεια από τα πέναντι ύψωμα και είδε τους νεοζηλαδούς να πολεμούν με το φλασκί, το κρασί από τη μια μεριά να πίνουν και το όπλο να ρίχνουν στο ρεξιτό θέση στην άλλη. Πολεμήσανε με θάρρος και ανδρεία. Αλλά τι τα θέλεις, ο πόλεμος είναι μια καταστροφή. Right. Right. Old man asked these brilliant questions, sir. Γίνεται μεγάλη τελετή στον Ομοχανίων από τις αρχές, από το επίσημο κράτος, στο οποίο λαβαίνει μέρος ο, όλος ο λαός, γιατί πιστεύει ότι αυτοί οι άνθρωποι ήρθαν από εκεί, από την, άκρη, από την άλλη άκρη του κόσμου και σκοτώθηκαν εδώ για την ελευθερία μας. Και εγώ προσωπικώς αισθάνομαι μεγάλη την υποχρέωση και κάθε χρόνο παρευρίσκομαι στο μνημόσυνο που γίνεται στο νεκροταφείο των συμμάχων, στο συμμαχικό νεκροταφείο της Σούδας που είναι θα μένει και οι Μαόροι. That's so sad. Problems with communications. That's so sad that a majority of the bodies were found when they were leaving, when they were retreating. That's incredibly sad, man. Y'all can 
pack us in like sardines to get us there. But when we need you to follow through, you're not there for us. Terrible, man. Eyes ...and a vastly better organized foe contributed to the fiasco that was the bitter Greece Creek campaign. First of all, I felt very embarrassed to think that um, here I am, a prisoner of war, all my boys um, taken over by someone else, and I thought, you know, um, I wondered how long I, I would be in captivity, and uh, sort of feeling of despair being left behind by the left of the, of the, of the, of the, of the lands and um, sheesh man sadness I suppose that absolutely you know, I, I wasn't quite sure whether I'll see any of my boys uh, again ever well that was how I felt at that time <sighs> after two years in captivity at various prisoner of war camps Hemi and a handful of other Maori were brought here to the Bavarian town of Eichstätt, to the camp Oflag Sieben B, the site of the district's police college. Wow. Hmm, I bet. I, this is where I was 50 years ago. Wow. A lifetime ago. You used to play football at a prisoner of war camp? What an insane feeling. It not much down there. What an insane feeling he must be feeling right now. 50 years ago, I was a prisoner yes. here and had no clue what my future Our held. Huts were down there. All the Maori boys were in the huts down there. There was little point for Maori to even attempt escape. A brown skin marked them more clearly than any uniform. Damn. Better than to accept their position and wait for the war's end. All movements night and day were overseen by the guards led by Hauptfeldwebel Hugo Zinsa. Auf der Kommandant durch, der Hauptfeldwebel dem unterstanden, a ein Stab von 120 Offizieren, Verwaltungsbeamte, Abwehrleute, Und dann vor allem eine große Verwaltung. Mm -hmm. This camp, being an officer's camp, it was very, very heavily guarded. Uh, many more guards than any other camp. And most of these fellows were fairly elderly. A lot of them um, were people who were sent back from Russia. And they had fur uh, no further use for them in the army as fighters. So they sent sent them here as guards. Wow. Good day. Sie waren im Lager. Okay. You just said you were here as a prisoner. Sie, mich wollen Sie nicht mehr kennen, wahrscheinlich. Okay. Ich bin nicht so viel bei, mit den Gefangenen zusammen gewesen. Said it's difficult oh, to yeah. remember you, your particular face, because but he was always with you all ah, for the whole time yeah. he was in here. But let me please, first of all, introduce you. It's uh, we'll start with the lady. This is Paula Walker. Yeah. This is the Gross Minister von Narimu. 
beim Zweiten Weltkrieg, er hat die höchste Auszeichnung, die Victoria Cross, gewonnen. Ja. Und sie ist dabei, weil Narimu, als er diese Auszeichnung gewonnen haben, ja. ist gefallen. Ja. Herr Zinse. Ja, Captain, das ist Captain Hemi Widemu. Ja. Das ja. ist Kenan Wee Huata. Ja. Er war ja. der Referent, ja. der Padre von der Maori in Italien in Sie Italien. Sind ein yes. in, ja. England, in England. Äh, ne? In English. Der war der Padre, der Referent von der Maori Battalion in Nordafrika, äh, in, in Italien. Italien. Ah. Und das ist Herr Zinser. Mm. He was Master Sergeant here. And oh. as he said, the Indian Vader Commons, the most important man in the camp. Oh, yes. As he <laughs> was the one who had to give the orders and pass them all on to you all. Ah, yes, and yes. This is Herr Strauss. Strauss. Okay. Herr Strauss. Nice to meet you. He was here. Uh, wounded on the Russian front, uh, came mm. back and had the good luck, he said himself, to have been told you can stay here, and he was in charge of the post. I can't control this feeling that I'm feeling right now. Am I wrong in thinking that this man was a prisoner, the Maori man and people on the left were a prisoner, while the dudes on the right were the ones that were holding them in the prison. Am I right about that? Because if I am, that explains this feeling about me not even jiving in this moment. I don't... The better part of me would like to say that I could do this and go and let bygones be bygones. But also in this very moment, I see, I feel the stank look on my face like, bro, you, you held me captive in war, bro. I could... I still got a bone to pick with you type thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, bruh. Can you remember him uh, in, the, in, in the post office? He said no. before that he was uh, in charge of having to sort out sometimes up to 3,000 pieces of uh, mail yeah. a week. All I, all I can remember is that all the letters I got, half of it was blacked out. The English letters. Er kann nur erinnern, dass von Meister von die Briefe, dass er erhalten habe, halb davon war mit schwarzer Kugel. Das habe ich nicht gemacht. Ich sehe, ich sehe. I don't find it funny. I don't find it funny. I know it's the past. I know it's over with. It still ain't funny. Ah, ha, 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 you, you're the one that blacked out my letters. Bruh, this Maori man is a strong individual. Ah. <laughs> Tell him that uh, <clears throat> the only letters they, they didn't black out were the Maori ones because they can't um, translate them. <laughs> Huh. Er hat gesagt, die einzigen Briefe, wo ja. das zuständig waren, ja. waren die, das war die Maori geschrieben. Ja. Weil, äh, keiner könnte hier die, äh, ja, die Wörter verstehen. Ja. <lacht> you don't remember me with, a, with the bald head? <lacht> Sie können seinen Glatzkopf nicht erinnern? Seine Glatzkopf Sie Ja, sicher. In, 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 in. Ich, ich habe ihn ja gesagt, ich kann mich genau noch erinnern. Dann, an, ja, ja. An, an yeah, yeah, genau, genau. He can yeah. remember you exactly. So, yes, good, <laughs> good, good. It's very pleasing to get back here. Brings back all the sad memories of um, myself and the other uh, Maori boys particularly, um, some of whom are now passed on. Um, I think all the peace. times we were together, and all our f other friends, of course, and... Although at the time I wanted to get out of here, it's nice to be back just once more to have a look at it and bring back memories of those days nearly 50 years ago. Bruh, I would have tried to detach so hard from that experience. I don't know if I've, I'd have it in me to go back there without it rekindling all those feelings. And then not know what what to do with them i i don't know man i'd feel weird putting myself in that position what about you their base established at mardi near cairo 
The New Zealand soldiers struggled to come to terms with their home for the next two years, the vast North African desert. Men in wide spaces with nothing in view but the horizon. What a starch contrast to the lush greenness of New Zealand. Ugh. And the blazing sun is very, very puny and insignificant. And the forces of nature are uh, too great to imagine. And the New Zealand division passing through a, a strange country and with strange conditions had to adjust themselves very quickly to the whole scene. They learned one of the truths of war, that actual combat is often a sudden climax to long periods of inactivity, boredom, and endless hard work. Recreation and sports were physically beneficial and good for morale. They did not, however, replace for most a man's home and family. Can't do that. Bully Jackson writing home to his mother. How are you tonight, Mum? Well, I hope. As for me, I am well. That's one thing I can say about myself. But I'm slightly browned off with this life. I want to go home. Strong bonds of friendship, already born of tribal links and deepened by mutual fear and struggle, counted the loneliness and became a powerful spur for the battalion's successes. No soldier could afford to let down his mates. And there was something comforting about being a member of a group with such identity and purpose. Brotherhood. Brotherhood. Mm. For the women at home in New Zealand, the exhilaration of young love had also been interrupted by war. They were lonely partners in marriage, often faced with offspring who had never known a father's caress. That's sad. Let's hope that I'll be home soon and may all your worries about me be over. And no needs too. It seems as though the biggest thrill of my life waiting for me at home. Little Derna. She must be a hard case, all right. Does she suck her thumb, Mum? So it's good night. Love to all Mary, Irwin, Kathy, Ty, Dad. And the same many times to yourself. May we all meet again soon. Have some muscles ready, Mum. Your loving son, Bully. Everything was fear. When you went into action, it was uh, all fear. I mean, you had uh, fear of being uh, wounded, fear of being maimed, fear of being killed. Uh, fear of uh, letting your troops down, uh, your side down, fear of uh, being defeated. It's just one, uh, one whole uh, fear fest. mess of fears. It's only when you are uh, given notice that you are going to do a certain attack, you have fear, right? I mean, uh, I just can't understand anybody now not having fear. But there are so many things you have to do prior to that attack. You forget about fear. Hmm. You forget it. And uh, by the time you get to the start line and you're ready to attack, you lost, absolutely lost as far as fear is concerned. You concentrate on what you have to do after that. The saying comes to mind, idle hands make the devil's work. Fear is work of the devil. That's his chief tool is fear, fear of a bunch of things. But fear is the root. And so 
immersing themselves in preparation for what they are fearful of eradicated the fear feeling of fear in the moment and got them to prepare for what they were scared for and so in preparation they eventually they realistic they stopped being fearful because they didn't have the mental space for fear because the mental space was now occupied by preparation i love that Idle hands make the devil's work. Stay busy. Whatever you're scared of, work on it. Work at it. Work toward it. Don't just sit there and be fearful. That's what I got from that. With the results, you do the job without worrying. You do worry, but you keep on going. You know, I used to feel sorry for our officer, for the Murray officers. While the soldiers are crawling on the ground, you know, they expect the officer to stand. He's supposed to be extra. And I used to admire these fellas, keeping the morale. Yeah. And those who are leading the Murray Battalion, they have to. They have to. To boost their men up going, going forward. Wow. I can only think about how empowered I would feel and how compelled I would feel to do more if I saw somebody in my position, my same position, or a rank above me, doing more. It's like they're living up to their rank and that makes me want to do my rank better. And so because you're pushing, I will push that much harder because you're pushing first. I will push that much harder behind you. Wow. Destroying the enemy is a reality of war. When the killing happened at long range, it could be very impersonal. The delivery mm -hmm. of death at close range was not so easy. Nope. My two subordinates and myself went down some uh, stairway in my mind i saw um i heard the song from akon anybody could take a life by pulling the trigger and then i remember the scene from shatas where mad max cuts the dude at his neck and thinking how personal that was versus I don't know like a drive-by or something you know what I mean as he into a concrete air raid shelter and in the shelter was a German officer and two Italians and as I stepped off the last um, uh, step of this stairway um, I noticed that the Italian who had his hands up, and they all had their hands up in a camarade position, uh, had a, a red object in his hand. And I knew immediately that it was an Italian grenade. They painted all their grenades red for some reason or other. And so I had to shoot the three of them uh, with a Tommy gun. And uh, that was my first introduction to um, to killing, as, as we put it, and it was rather, it was very... Your first, and it's three people in one go? Sad, actually, a sad moment, um, because uh, I went through his, the captain's um, belongings, and uh, personal effects and um, found so a picture a of family. himself and his three lovely children and uh, this was a very traumatic moment for me because one he's relates, human one soldier relates to another at the beginning of the desert campaign the Germans seemed certain to overwhelm the allies Rommel's progress was hampered by difficulties with supplies and was finally arrested at Al Alamein when they were forced to retreat Individual stories of heroism abound. At Mitarea Ridge, stretcher bearer Corporal James Pidihi braved intense shell fire to tend to the wounded and bury the dead. Once in the face of enemy machine gun fire, he dressed the wounds of a German soldier and carried him to safety. Wow. At Gazala, Private Charlie Shelford saved his encircled platoon. He ran 300 yards toward an enemy machine gun post, shooting from the hip. 
Despite taking shrapnel from three grenades and having his own gun smashed, he grenaded the enemy position and began the collapse of resistance in that area. Wow. From the Libyan campaign onwards, Mr. Charles Bennett, a Pakeha civilian, was in charge of Tero Aroha, a mobile canteen given by the Maori children of New Zealand. Charlie Y.M. drove the beloved van in the fiercest of battles to keep the men supplied with cigarettes, sweets, razors, and other goods from home. Wow. Wir haben vor El Alamein haben wir Maori Soldaten gefangen genommen. Das waren gute Kämpfer, das wussten wir. Von der Infanterie, ich war nicht Infanterie, ich war Panzeraufklärung im Spähwagen und äh, wir haben das gewusst. Von der äh, Infanterie, dass sie sehr harte, gute Leute waren. Ja, das waren schon tapfere Soldaten und wie gesagt gut ausgebildet. Denn Minen, das war immer ein teuflisches Geschäft mit Minen zu arbeiten. Sie hm. müssen so gut ausgebildet gewesen sein, dass denn nie was passiert ist. Manchmal ging doch eine Mine hoch beim Verlegen, wenn man Zünder kam oder irgendetwas. Jeez. Und die Maoris haben die Minen da ausgegraben, noch auf die Seite gelegt, ohne irgendwie anzugreifen. Entweder war das eine Art Sport oder war das irgendwo ins Ärgern oder irgendetwas. That's hilarious. Auf alle Fälle ist an sich gar nichts passiert. Kein Angriff von Maoris, sondern nur die Minen ausgegraben, auf die Seite gelegt und am Morgen waren sie wieder weg. Wow. That's the push funny. northwards to meet the first army in Tunisia continued. When a pass was found which would enable the Allies to outflank strong fortifications, the battalion went in. The battle for Tobago Gap started with heavy artillery and air support. Colonel Charles Bennett assigned C Company under Peter Awatere to take a German-held feature point 209. From the base of a hill later called Hikurangi, Lieutenant Wanangarimu led his platoon straight up the steep rocky slopes. He wow. single-handedly wiped out two enemy strongposts. His kinsman, Corporal Wiwi Teneti, kept two machine gun nests quiet until his men could outflank and destroy them. From only yards away, the Germans charged with their bayonets. They were repulsed. By nightfall, Awatere and Narimu were both wounded. They refused to seek attention and held back repeated bayonet charges. Only when his wounds reduced him to crawling about did Awatere agree to get medical assistance. Narimu stayed. Throughout wow. the night, he kept his men awake and... What an absolute animal. Wow, resilient. Oh, the spirit to fight. Oh. Oh, bruh, until he could not physically move his body in an upright manner, he was fighting. Oh, the chills. Oh, my goodness. Such willpower. But for continual German attacks, each time they were driven back by bullet, bayonet, and even stones used as makeshift grenades. Wow. On and on the battle went. Both sides were mauled by horrific casualties. Through the carnage, Narimu exhorted his men to greater effort. At daybreak, he was killed during an advance, his body falling on top of those he had just shot. The German casualties Damn. became insupportable. Appeals from them for medical aid signaled the beginning of the end of the battle. Narimu's leadership and bravery inspired Colonel Bennett to recommend him for the Victoria Cross. I took him back to the uh, to the cemetery, already prepared, and laid him to rest there. Well, <clears throat> you know, it's a sad occasion when you spend um, um, all all night fighting and. Um, uh, and then you have to turn around and bury your comrades. It's, uh, it's, um, and looking back on it, uh, I still get very emotional about it. <clears throat> it's a thing that uh, I'll never forget. How and, good you uh, are. I don't think uh, any soldier who served uh, over here, overseas, will ever forget the war. A lot of people think, say that the war is over. It's been over nearly 50 years, but to a soldier, it, 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 it's, no. uh, it'll be there always. You can't take that away from him, from them. 
And uh, being back here, I can see uh, <clears throat> all the, uh, the battle in, in operation. The dive bombers, um, and um, <clears throat> especially remember to the pilots that uh, failed to pull out of their dive and go crashing into the hills across the way there. God, grief. This is equivalent to... This is equivalent to being in another dimension. You get me? This man, when he looks at this area, he sees war. When I look at this area, I see a desert. I see I see a place that needs rain. I see normal human things. This man lives in a different dimension within himself. He sees bomber pilots. He sees explosions. He hears gunfire. He hears grenades. It's just mind-boggling. And then the uh, <clears throat> tanks and the infantry riding on the, the tanks and f the infantry falling off as they've been shot at from, from the uh, Germans. All those things, even and our own chaps going into the shells and um, chaps uh, wounded. You never forget those things. The next engagement was at Tekruna. During this battle, 12 out of 17 officers were casualties, including Colonel Bennett. New leaders and tactics had to be found quickly. Well, there is confusion, all right, but uh, at the same time, every man uh, attacking would try and get into position as best they can. And it is very difficult, but in the main, we seemed to get to our objective altogether. And that was the main thing about it. But on in this instance, the Takruna hill up here was a big obstacle. We were in the Bukhara, and the people were in the Bukhara, and the Kaaba was in the Bukhara. She was in the Bukhara, she was in the Bukhara, she was in the Bukhara, she was in the Bukhara. And she was in the Bukhara, 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 she was in the Bukhara. وهربت طبيت للبيت. وانت شكون تعمل؟ ايه كي شادهم علينا المان. ايه. الانجليز بخر التالي والمان راح بس حدان. وانت شكون تعمل لك الوقت هذاك؟ نطيبوا فطورنا. اها. اخي نطيبوا فطورنا والله العظيم فطورنا راس بالله عندي كي توك. والمان ما هي والمان شاد هنا نحن جينا في الوسط هربنا. ما بس درنا ما درناش. شيش. اما ما ارتاحوا رانا ما ارتاحوا قدامنا ونحن نجار وعربي. زادوا كل هذا. Takruna was a massive rock edifice which dominated the surrounding countryside. The Italians and Germans intended to hold it at all costs. B Company's part in the assault involved Sergeants Manahi and Rogers. With about a half a dozen men each, they fought their way up Takruna's awesome sheer face. They took the village on top, but the enemy soon counterattacked. Manahi climbed back down and returned with... Can you fathom how much advantage the people on top of the hill had and how the Maori was still able to come up and siege and take over that's incredible position can you imagine the grit and the fierceness with which the Maori fought in order to scale that that sharp face and then ensue battle uh, the spirit in these people is unbelievably incredible reinforcements there was a desperate battle soldiers were shot bayoneted and pushed over the cliff for two days Takruna was hidden in the haze of battle its capture by the battalion caused England's general Horrocks to remark that it was the most gallant feat of arms he had witnessed during the war easily decorations highlight individual heroism but hide the fact that the Mari battalion always fought as one becoming a startlingly effective fighting unit Wow in the Maori Battalion, all the men we had were nothing but the best. They were second to none. And uh, whatever decorations the officers have in the Maori Battalion belong to the men, to the battalion, the battalion as a whole. I'm 
24 years old. Well, I wonder why he joined the war. I know I wouldn't have. If I was a man that age and it was voluntary, I wouldn't have joined it. I see when it gets mentioned that I can see the hurt in Nanny's eyes and I feel sorry for her and... I feel similar to that. However, there's this part of me wondering if the guilt of not knowing if my lack of participation would result in the loss overall and then the loss at home coming from not going to defend. I think the guilt would force me to go. What if me and other people like me making the decision like I'm making for the reasons that I'm making the decision are the exact number of force needed for the overwhelm of the enemy to maintain what we have. You see what I'm saying? I feel like that would mess with me and I'd be forced to go and I'd be mad that I'm there. So I would fight harder. But again, this is all, this is all just what ifs, but to know that people went through this, it's, it's, it's incredible. My, again, human experiences vary so greatly. It's, it's almost impossible for me to put myself in this position, but sitting from the outside, I could talk about it all day, but actually being there, I have no idea what I do. And then that's wild. I'd like to think that I'd go with my brothers and defend my brothers and hopefully make it back home just like everybody else that went did, I assume. Hmm. I have to think, just like every other company, C Company was just like every other company. Um, and I know it's, got, uh, it's had the highest casualty number. Most people were wounded. It just makes me wonder why they joined and So many of them died, they were so young. I have to wonder why they joined. Now imagine if history was altered and the the aid of the Maori wasn't there and Germany took over. What world would we be living in right now? what gets me the most why they joined for was well and sure why they joined Yeah, Nai fiti a nau nau, fiti ngā ārangi, tatau uruora, tamate ngana, taururangi, tamaroto, tūranga roto, tamari ko mata o te rangi, o te wakatapu, 
Right before he said that thing about Job, that we come with nothing, we leave with nothing, and the Lord giveth and the Lord takes away, so is the nature of God. Right before he said that, I thought to myself that the greatest show of love is to lay one's life down for their brother. And that's exactly what they did. And that's the reason why. They volunteer to lay their lives down and show love for their their land, their families, their people. That's why they did it. I'm sure there's a myriad other reasons, but that one sticks out to me to answer her question to my own question. Why? Why, if it's a volunteer job, why would you risk your own life? Because that's the greatest show of love. And that's what the Maori people are. Is, is love incarnate? It's beautiful. 
In Italy, mountainous country made progress difficult. It was a war of attrition. The victor would be the side who inflicted the most casualties. At Pascuccio, Corporal Henry Barrett scaled a cliff and destroyed a machine gun post. His men then fixed bayonets and wiped out other positions. Barrett himself wow. killed nine Germans. Captain Monte Wikilifi displayed magnificent leadership and tactics at Cassino before being severely wounded. He refused to imperil his men by being carried out. With shattered legs, he dragged himself along the ground under fire for 15 hours to safety. For two days on the outskirts of Port. What? What? Wounded. He refused to imperil his men by being carried out. With shattered legs, he dragged himself along the ground under fire for 15 hours to safety. Shattered legs. Drug himself under fire for 15 hours. What? What? Bro, Superman ain't got nothing on these on 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 people that go to war. Superman ain't got nothing on them, bro. My experiment. Get on the floor and start moving yourself forward with army crawl, no legs. Now imagine on top of that, any movement at all sends an indescribable wave of pain throughout your body, leaving no cell not vibrating in pain. Two shattered legs, under fire, 15 hours, drug himself. Absolute ch champion bruh i hope to have a percentage of that kind of fight in my life in me oh right it's 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 i'm hearing the words i'm saying them out loud to myself and i'm trying to comprehend but <laughs> i can't even do stuff for 15 minutes sometimes Depending on what workout I do, I, might, I struggle to do it for 15 seconds to pull half of my body while the other half is dismantled. Pull. Every movement hurts, bruh. Every, breathing hurts. Wow. 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 I can't. I can't. I can't do it. For two days on the outskirts of Popiano, under very heavy shell fire, Captain Tormwana ran between platoons rallying and urging them on until the enemy tanks and infantry withdrew. On 4th of August, 1944, the liberation of Florence. Our interest to Florence was exciting and I was with Colonel Lovatere. And we were on the jeep and uh, it was a sort of a competition between the 23rd Battalion and the 28th Battalion to enter Florence. And he came over the air for the battalion to take cover. Just came over. And we took cover and then they rained the place with shelling. And I was an eyewitness to many, many of the people who came out to meet us. Die, children, women. But none of us got killed there because we understood it and we took cover. The Mari soldiers and the Italian people rapidly acquired a liking for each other. They found much in common with communal lifestyles and a joint love of song. Even though this is a joyous moment, I can still feel her pain as she's sitting here. Look at the look in her eyes, the look on her face. She's there, but she's not there. She is affected tremendously by this, and I feel every bit of her. And I'm sad for her. My heart goes out to her.
She almost got hit in the face. The Maori proved adept at learning the languages of whichever country they found themselves in. The Maori language, too, became a code which could not be broken by German intelligence. In Italy, there was humorous confusion over the Maori habit of greeting the locals. The Maori, Chiora, sounded very similar to the Italian for, what's the time? Chiora, <laughs> que hora es? I love that. Well, that Spanish is not necessarily Italian, but they similar. I get it. I love it. That's funny. After five minutes, came back. Across this this area, where a Parker fella was under a a, a carrier, and they called Makarini to Wawa Lake, and so my my Robbie said to me, Padre, we got three minutes, three minutes, and we must get out of this place. So the grab thing, I grabbed something, it looked like an axe to me anyway. So I just grabbed hold of it and cut his leg off, and threw him on the on the on the under the jeep. And when no sooner we pulled out, down came the uh, the shelling. So we got over. Then Robert, he said to me, "What?" My area, helping out the wounded. Then we came across this this area where a Parker fella was under a a, a carrier. Ingan ni ko makarini to wawa lake. And so my my Robert said to me, "Padre, we got three minutes. Three minutes." And we must get out of this place. So the grab thing, I grabbed something. It looked like an axe to me anyway. So I just grabbed hold of it and cut his leg off. And threw him on the, on the, on the, under the jeep. And when no sooner we pulled out, down came the, uh, the shelling. Oh, my goodness. Uh, then Robert, he said to me, You know that A company language? And uh, I said, yes. We nearly died, eh? <laughs> However, and far as I was concerned, I think there was no hope for this fella because he was, was bleeding mm -hmm. and the thing like that. And I, I never, never come across him till many, many, many years after I was taken in Enzac in Waitara. Oh. And who should turn up was well, this fella. I did know him. And he just said to me, hey, or well, he his wife, this is the man that saved me. Oh wow. How crazy. Was it? And when he mentioned fire, as soon as he said the crossroad, off I went and just told the story. I said, well, I'm glad that uh, we're back. Wow. And, uh, but many experiences like that took place. Because never. And then when you had to tie up, look, the, the fellowship or the brotherhood, in the in the in the park of Maori was just so. Just so. This pig is for the Maori battalion, and to her new owner, she shows an almost dog-like devotion. <laughs> Bringing home the wine is a responsible job. The first step in turning pig into pork, and for the onlookers, quite a cheering sight. After weeks and months on tin bully beef, this is certainly a sight worth watching. Tomorrow will be a lovely day. The classically beautiful city of Florence was a warm host to the Maori battalion, as were its citizens. Fighting in the desert had not generally affected the local populations. In Italy, however, 
The presence of so many people living in and around the battlegrounds meant difficulty for the soldiers and danger for the innocent. The Māori soldiers had a belief in their ability to fight, as well as a deep belief in God and the hereafter. Mm -hmm. The five padres who served with the battalion were vital to the men's morale. Got plenty of belts to sell. Yes, yeah. good prices for you. They carry God with them in battle. Good? Yes. Discount? Sure. 10% discount today. Oh, it's very good. Because it's cloudy. Cloudy. Yeah. At the age of 26, we Huata was in the front line, comforting the wounded and ministering to the dead. War forced him to redefine his faith. Do you like this place? Sure. It's fun. Very good. It's fun to send to people. My stuff have six months guarantee. Guarantee. <laughs> I was quite clear in my mind to destroy the enemy, so I prayed that way. And I firmly believe that uh, the Maori battalion should go home alive. And so my prayers went that way. Destroy Absolutely. Destroy the enemy so that we could get, get, get home to New Zealand quickly and everybody alive. And so when the fellow used to say to me, Hey, Padre, what about that part thou shalt not kill? I said, Oh, don't worry about that too much. I said, Either you or him. We were always prepared spiritually, and when we went into battle, <clears throat> we felt we had somebody watching over us. What I say? Oh, I'm so in tune, baby. I just said it about 15 seconds ago that they took God into battle with them. Ah. And. Uh, and when we came up against the enemy, well, it was either him or us. And I'm sure he felt the same way about it. Uh, that was the story behind it. And without that uh, spiritual uh, uh, build-up before, we, and if we ever went into battle without it, oh, we felt we felt uh, there was something wrong. Yeah. And we weren't the same. Uh, same troops. Go with God. Period. That's how I felt it. And I'm sure the boys felt the same way. Well, although I was behind um, barbed wire at that time, and I wasn't with you fellas, my prayers were always for you and the battalion to get home safely, um, whatever happens. The Benedictine Monastery, founded in 529 AD, overlooked the township of Cassino. It was thought to contain German snipers. In one of the most remembered but also futile decisions of the Italian campaign, this sacred place of God was delivered of 600 tons of high explosives. Humans gonna always try to bring God down, bruh. But you can't do it. I can't do it. That's just the building. <laughs> Fools. God is everywhere. Ha ha. Before their attack on the Casino railway station, the Māori soldiers of A and B companies gathered together in the warm dusk of a beautiful day. They attended to personal matters. Some wrote letters, while others cleared their pockets in case of capture. When the Padre arrived, there was a feeling amongst the two companies that this battle was going to be tough. They were not to know that of 200 men, only 70 would return to fight again. The Padre Jeez. called them to prayer and said, Father, look down upon us this moment. Help us to do that which we have to do. Tonight, take those that you want. Tomorrow, let us weep those that are left. Through thy son, Jesus Christ, let us go on. documentary so it just reinforced what i've learned about the maori people that they are love and that they will defend what is their own fiercely they didn't have to but they chose to do the right thing because they saw 
the potential for if they did not volunteer themselves that the evil that they had volunteered themselves to stop would spread and affect their home and so they made that decision that tough decision and a lot of them didn't make it back incredible man some of the feats that these men were able to do just absolutely mind-boggling the fierceness, the strength, the spirit. This was an incredible documentary. And I'm so glad that I watched it. And I'm glad that you were here to watch it with me. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Consider becoming a member. That's how I'll go visit all the islands and make my way back home eventually. Help me out by becoming a member. I appreciate you being here with me and I pray I'll see you in the next video. Love.